Now, we would like to present the first panel discussion of the day, Cities and Economy Shaping Architecture, which will include His Royal Highness Saud Al -Sa Prince Saud Al Saud from Ariad Development Authority, Abdul Ila Al Sheikh, Urban Management and the Economic Policy Expert, Dr. Anas Al Faris, King Abdul Aziz City for Science and Technology. Moderated by Jawahar Asteri from Al Nahda Research Center for Research. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very proud of everyone for making it so early on a Saturday. Um, so, before I call our panelists to join us um, uh, on stage, I would like to introduce them. And I will not do justice to any of them because everyone that we have here is so exceptional. Um, I, I guarantee that we will have a great uh, discussion. Um, our first panelist is Her His Royal Highness Prince Saud bin Nahar. He's the director of the Transit Oriented Development Department at the Riyadh Development Authority. Um, His Royal Highness has been with ADA uh, since uh, 2010 as an urban planner participating in a wide range of planning and Riyadh metro projects, including uh, developments around King Khalid International Airport, Princess Noura University and Capsarc. He has earned his uh, bachelor degree and ma uh, master's of science degrees from Bartlett School of Planning, UCL. Uh, our second panelist is Dr. Anas Al Faris, an assistant professor at Ka uh, King Abdul Aziz Center for Science and Technology and visiting assistant professor at MIT. He's the co-director of the Center of, for Complex Engineering Systems uh, at CAXT and, uh, and MIT and the co director of the De uh, Decision Support Center for CAXT and Boeing. He serves as a senior advisor to the, uh, to the Saudi Minister of Economy and Planning. Uh, Dr. Faris has a, a bachelor, bachelor in Architecture and uh, Building Engineering from King Saud University, a Master of Building Technology, and a Master of Science in, in, in Design Studies from the University of Pennsylvania, and a Master of Science and PhD in Design Computation from MIT. And our third panelist is Abdul uh, Abdel al-Sheikh, uh, Senior v uh, Vice President for the Real Estate and Infrastructure Division for Public Investment Fund since January 2018. Uh, right before that, Abdul Ilah was a Senior Policy Advisor to, to the Ministry of Municipal and Ru Rural Affairs and, the lead development, um, and led the development of the new div uh, vision, goal, and objectives that were approved by CEDA in March 2015. He has earned his Bachelor's Degree in Business Administration from the King Saud University and his master's in urban management from the University of Canberra, Australia. I'd like to invite everyone to join me on stage. Sabah al khair. So, um, as mentioned yesterday, our panels were, uh, we covered education, sustainability, and practice. And today, we're going to scale it up, and we're going to go to the scale of economies and cities shaping architecture. So, the discussion will be different to give us a background on transit-oriented development, especially as this is something that you're leading at ADA and will shape architecture in Riyadh significantly. Oh, would you like to start? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Well, and I would like, uh, well, good morning. I would like to thank uh, Jawahir and uh, Dar al uh, for this great initiative. And uh, uh, really, we are proud to have something like this uh, in the city of Riyadh for the kingdom to talk about this kind of uh, aspects. Uh, TOD uh, actually uh, is a transformation story, I think. Uh, Transit-oriented development looks at areas around stations uh, and uh, looks at develop developing areas around the station, actually, and transformation, transform, transforming these areas to a new urban uh, hub for uh, people to enjoy, live, and work and play. So this area uh, is a transformation area. We look for uh, a new urban aspect to see in it, walkability, uh, a lot of uh, infrastructure uh, for people, actually, not for buildings at this time. 
uh, and we look at an aspect uh, that is new for the city, which is architecture uh, of transit, actually. This aspect is to uh, put the journey for the rider from the, to the station, actually, with good architecture, good walkability, uh, access for all these stations. Should we show, show uh, actually the, the video? Uh, actually, the video is, is uh, related to the metro. I wanted uh, to give uh, sure. uh, yes, yeah. uh, a brief for the metro. And uh, so if we could have Should we start? Yes, Should we start with the video? The video showed that the uh, King Abdul Aziz public transport uh, project is, is, is one of the biggest projects that it will transform the city planning-wise, architecture-wise, and give a new mobility form mm -hmm. for the city and will support, actually, the people. Our computers are not as early as everyone here, so it's going to take a moment. But it's a, this is, we, we, we were very keen to discuss the, the metro and transit-oriented development. I don't think a city has seen um, the, um, this, the development of six lines of metro uh, come together at once. Um, and, and I think that we're about to, to witness a transformation in the city that uh, will change the way we experience Riyadh significantly. The king has Here we a go. vision for Riyadh. an ambitious endeavor. allow state-of-the-art trains to pass right through the center of Riyadh.
building a city we can all be proud of. As you said, uh, it's the biggest project, metro project uh, in the Middle East and one of the biggest in the world. And this is something uh, uh, actually was uh, needed at the time uh, as the population growth rate of the city of Riyadh went up uh, uh, dramatically and, and it was in the top 10, top ten uh, cities of the world congestion uh, doubled and, and this was uh, something that we needed uh, to do actually and it is one of the uh, elements to have in a sustainable city uh, is, is the metro and uh, hopefully it will, uh, uh, it will uh, people will benefit from this project and use it actually and it will be a transformation for mobility planning and architecture. Um, so, I, I mean, the video shows, um, uh, I think, the, maybe the first transformation that we'll see or the first architectural contribution that we'll make, that the metro will make is there are some iconic stations coming up, uh, but then there's going to be a change in the way we experience the city and, and uh, with transit-oriented development, we're going to see a change in how residential and commercial development comes together. Um, Dr. Anas, before I start with you, since there's a presentation and we need to switch laptops, We'll, uh, we'll start with you, uh, Abdelilah. Um, uh, from your perspective, especially now that you're looking at intercity development, perhaps you can uh, share with us um, your perspective uh, from where you sit at PIF, um, how cities and economies are going to shape architecture in Riyadh and in other cities in the country. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's just interesting, tw some 20 years ago, my father was also part of a discussion in Dar al-Ulum al uh, The foundation invited him at a time to talk about cities and urban development, so I think it's more of a deja vu or something. So thank you very much for this invitation and for also being at Al-Faisal, which we are very proud of uh, being part of. Uh, it's interesting today that also while we're talking here about cities, we, there's a, a global forum about cities in Kuala Lumpur. And today there's a session which uh, the kingdom is participating in, which is about urbanization and development, and it's talking about investing in transformation forces for cities. So I think there's this whole debate globally about cities and transformation. And also we have this whole transformation, of course, happening in the kingdom with 2030. Uh, today, uh, the kingdom uh, is a highly urbanized uh, country. 80% uh, of our population of 20, 32 million which has been reported lately, live in cities. 70% of that 80% live in 70, 16 cities. So we very ha have a high concentration of population in cities, in major cities, and also, of course, in the big five, uh, which you call them the big boys. And uh, we'll talk later about city management, maybe, or something about that uh, discussion. So the whole challenge we will be facing, I mean, the transformation that the Metro will have on the city like Riyadh. I see it as uh, also with the TODs, hopefully when they are launched and, and interest is, is there for to develop, is like planting the trees in a very low meadow, in a meadow uh, uh, of low density in Riyadh. So hopefully those trees will thrive and, 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 and create that kind of uh, uh, texture and image and scene for the city. And I think that's where the, the architecture side of shaping the a new image of the city, creating a new layer of Riyadh after 50 years of development, I think is important. But let me touch on some things that if, uh, if anybody has read or has been uh, looking at very closely at the Vision 2030 
and looking how it has its spatial impact on, on, on what we're looking at. So, I mean, from just reading it and trying to understand it, uh, it will have a dramatic impact on economies of the cities uh, with new service uh, sectors. So, uh, these service sectors will provide, will also demand for new, new uh, land use and a shift in those land uses to more urban offices uh, and agglomerations. So, those will have a very huge, whether it's in the form of TODs or inner city redevelopment or any types of agglomerations, will also have an impact on how we express that in an architecture form. So I think that is a very important area to look at. Uh, that also will lead to new, new opportunities for urban regeneration. Today, this whole urban sprawl we've been experiencing for 50 years. Yesterday, there was a discussion by uh, uh, Azit al Dreyther and uh, Abdul Latif al Mshari, uh, which I really totally agree with. I mean, this whole leapfrog from an, a very communal settlement into a urban sprawl was a very a major shock in our, in, our, in our way of introducing the car and, and increasing mobility. So, uh, today, uh, how to reverse that, how to bring cities back to people and bring space back to people, I think that is bringing architects and planners to an area of urban design and bringing urban design to the discussion, I think is an important area we need to also look at. Uh, therefore, we look at uh, the whole uh, housing topology. We looked at, I mean, it was interesting yesterday to understand that Kuwait does not have a diversity. I mean, we complain about diversity of topology and we find in Kuwait they only have one, one type of home or, other than an apartment, which is a villa, we at least have introduced duplexes, introduced to different types. But also the, the, the courthouse and the type of, of communal uh, development we lost in the, in the past 50 years, I think is something for our, our, our young architects to start to explore and look at how can we regenerate that into a new language or a new way of design and incorporate it within a city a block or a city. And there's lots of opportunities that will come in the future, inshallah, I mean, in this area. Uh, so, I mean, these are major challenges that I think, uh, and opportunities, if we look at it in a positive way, uh, for uh, looking at our cities to, to, to compact and, and, and be more efficient. And just I'll close my talk about this in a very interesting observation by someone who visited the kingdom several times and we had a sitting with one of the mayors and we were talking about public transport. And he said, at the level that you're developing today in terms of density, the first challenge is that you need to develop, double your density of cities. The second challenge is once you complete that doubling of density, is to double it again. <laughs> so I think uh, our laid back, uh, urban sprawl and development uh, has taken its toll on our cities and I think the economic rationale if we take it in that form is becoming uh, very uh, I mean uh, unsustainable so I think we really seriously need to look at how can we bring back some kind of uh, structure and image to our cities and I think that's where an area for our, our young architects even our senior architects to start thinking about Thank you. Uh, Dr. Anas, would you like to uh, present? Yes, so perhaps if, you, if you'd like to use the podium because, so that you can flip, exactly. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Jamia. Just, just a little background. Uh, I come from a computational engineering background, so uh, the focus has been over the last several years on, on smart cities, applications of, of big data analytics and, uh, and AI within, uh, within uh, both c cities or nations. And, and we look at that in multiple ways. Um, uh, I'm an associate professor both at, at CAXT and, 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 and MIT, but just to give you more of a of background on, on one of our projects, I was told to keep it around 15 minutes, so I'll try my best to do so. Um, I pulled a presentation that I've had, um, that we've just presented a, f maybe a few 
couple of months ago, which, which I thought would, would be more suitable to try to reduce it as, as well. But just to give you more of a background where we come from, I'll, I'll give more of a background of what CAXT is. Um, uh, we'll talk about the Joint Centers of Excellence Program. I'll move from there uh, to CCS, or the Center for Complex Engineering Systems. Uh, then I'll move towards city dynamics, which is the core of, of the presentation for today. Uh, I'll then discuss some of the domains that we tend to, to apply our uh, platform to, and then I'll end with a few additional uh, slides. Uh, I'm, I'm skipping the city dynamics engine just because it's a bit too technical and, and maybe not, not, not worth getting into at this stage. So quickly, on, on background, for those who are not familiar with, uh, with CAX, CAX is both the national labs uh, of the kingdom as, as well as the uh, National Science Foundation. We tend to do uh, four main activities. They include uh, policy design for science and technology, uh, support uh, of uh, uh, research, that's, that's, um, uh, that's through uh, activities related to funding and grants to universities, as well as our own research, um, uh, which is through our national labs. Uh, finally, we support innovation. And that's through incubators, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, with Badr uh, as a main uh, element of that. Um, currently, we're transforming uh, our institutes into 10 institutes. Uh, I'm, one of my hats is I'm the, the vice president for uh, CACS when it comes down to, to research institutes. And one main component that, that we target is what's called the Joint Centers of Excellence Program. Uh, or JSEP for short. Uh, JSEP has a very strict and specific goal. It's to generate the next generation of uh, technical scientists, and, and uh, we do those so in, in a very particular manner, and I'll explain it in, in a few. Any questions? Um, and um, so, more on JSEP. JSEP was uh, started a few years back, uh, now we're in our fourth year, and, and we had a fairly specific objectives, as, as I said, it's, it's building human capital, the next generation of human capital. We went on um, establishing collaborations with leading institutions, um, my home base at MIT, but in addition we have Stanford, Berkeley, um, uh, Northwestern, Oxford, Cambridge, Caltech, just to name a few. And so we have currently over 14 uh, institutes, uh, sorry, centers uh, that map to different areas of research depending on, on what we're looking at. So in the case of MIT, it's on complex systems. Um, with with uh, Michigan, for example, it's on radar technology and, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have three main objectives. Uh, skilled researchers, research and IP as, as an output, eventually commercialization whenever um, possible. Now, with skilled researchers, it's a core element for the work we've been doing. Uh, we've been also fairly fortunate to develop, uh, we've been able to develop what we call the Advanced Training Program, and, and, uh, or ATP for short. Uh, ATP is a specific program where we try to identify the best of the best of what Saudi Arabia has to offer. We put them in a fairly aggressive program of two years, where in the case, for example, of MIT, they work with the MIT faculty. These are Saudi boys and girls, uh, both either with bachelor's or with a master's, and uh, 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 put them in this, this two-year program where they work on research projects. So everything you're going to be seeing, really, at the end, um, uh, in my case, I'm only the director, and, and not by any means the one who's actually doing a lot of the heavy lifting. And so we'll, you'll see more of, of that in, in the in the, uh, in the following slide. Okay, CCS, uh, the core of our presentation. As I mentioned, it focuses on um, um, what we call complex systems. These include systems that, uh, such as um, uh, uh, both um, hard or soft systems, energy, water, transportation, representing some of those hard systems, health, labor, uh, education as uh, systems that cover the soft systems. Currently we have more than 80 members uh, um, focusing on, on multiple projects that fit into that bigger context. Oops. So this is just, just an overview of the members who have been working on these projects. And, and just to give you the scale of it. Uh, so we have several PIs who are divided both between Riyadh and MIT. We have several researchers who have been 
doing and working on, on, uh, on the projects, and we even have several software developers who have been contributing to the, to the projects. Um, why do we care? And, and again, I'm, I'm just showcasing one center out of the 14 we have. Um, why do we care? This is uh, the Pope's inauguration back in 2005. And this is the same event in 2013. And we start seeing the dramatic change that has happened and occurred in this last decade. And, and the reason why, we are able now to both capture information in ways we've never been able to and process it in ways that we've never been able to. As we've heard just a few minutes ago, uh, the, our population currently in the kingdom is more than 30 million with more than 100 cities all producing uh, data. Now, let's focus just briefly on our project. This is one of the major projects we run at the center, and which is the City Dynamics Project. As I mentioned, we look at hard systems. These are um, communication systems, water systems, energy systems, waste systems, mobility, and urbanism on, on one end. And on the other, we look at soft systems. So these are health, education, innovation, uh, all the way to governance. And we, we understand that the human is at the center of, of the whole thing, where, where social cultural systems are also very critical to us. Um, we also interact with the environment, and so we know that these systems are interacting heavily with the environment and are influenced by and influenced uh, through as well the environment. But more importantly, uh, these systems are also highly interconnected, which, which makes it critical for us to understand. So we're always not only interested in first order effects. Uh, in other words, um, a change in one system at one point is one thing, but as it propagates into other systems, that's where it really becomes very critical. And so from our perspective, we're always interested in that end order effect. A decision that was done at one system that propagated throughout uh, and, and then capturing that as, as we progressed. And then we develop what we call decision support systems that capture a great deal of that as, as they interact. Uh, and we have an engine that we've developing uh, for the last several years, which is called the City Dynamics Engine that really captures a great deal of that. So to, just to give you a flavor of what we do, I'll just go very quickly on some of these systems and, and give you, a, and, and, and whenever I'm, I'm really running late, just give me a hint, so I'll just speed up on, on whatever needs to be. So with environment, here we, we worked with the ADA, we pulled a lot of, of data from their stations just to understand what's happening in air quality within, within the Riyadh uh, region, within Riyadh city. And so we can capture what's happening on a daily basis and understand it as well. Uh, but, but further, we can start mapping what's happening in the air quality within the city itself and, and what's happening specifically to two metrics which we all tend to capture, which is PM 2.5 and PM 10. And these are just particulate matters in the air that we try to capture. Um, and we can see the changes across time and space uh, within the city. Uh, but, but more interestingly, um, this was a, a test we had done uh, several uh, months ago uh, on comparing a lot of what was happening with, with what the WHO uh, had produced, and we found that uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Riyadh, sorry, is not really as bad as it was claimed. In fact, the data uh, that was produced was, was fairly missing several elements, and so we noticed that Riyadh is actually very comparable if we follow exactly the same guidelines of the WHO to many cities you see in purple here. And the rank moved, I think, uh, currently it's 214, which, is, which makes it much more uh, acceptable, at least in, 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 in logic. But very quickly as well, so we start seeing with this data a lot of any influxes of changes. And here we, start, we see that, that spike in, in, uh, in particulates. This was, of course, due to a sandstorm. So we capture that and we understand it. But more importantly, we can start even simulating. Uh, this is because we don't have satellite data. So uh, due to the fact that this sandstorm happened at night, so we can actually simulate the storm coming in Riyadh just literally from the sensors. And so we could capture the sensors, understand where the storm came in, what did it hit first, and how did it propagate through the city. Energy is an area we, we tend to look at as well. So, sorry. so we want to understand So we want to understand what, what, how does the city change throughout. And so we've been doing our own uh, building, both what we call a data model versus a simulation model as well, where we're trying to understand, is the data telling us 
what the simulation uh, or what we expect should be. And the reason there is we're trying to identify anomalies within the city. Uh, in other words, if the simulation tells us this is what the consumption should be, but the data is telling us something else, we can quickly identify where the problems and the gaps in the system uh, come, come to be. And this is, this is showing it for Riyadh campus, uh, well, sorry, within a, a region within, within Riyadh. I think this was in Muruj, uh, where we were capturing the data and, and just uh, analyzing it. And, and this, sorry, just to give credit as well, um, this is with SEC, so we've been working heavily with SEC. And apologies for the acronyms, that's uh, the Saudi Electricity Company. And from that, we can start seeing and understanding uh, everything that relates to the patterns of energy consumption. We can know differentiations of energy consumption in Ramadan versus Fridays versus autumns and spring, winter and summer. We can understand residentials versus non-residentials and so on and so forth. And we can start looking at how does energy flow in the city as people move we know that energy flows with them. And the question is, how does that, those two correlate as well? And so we're very interested in understanding that correlation fairly well. Um, I'll skip some of this. This is a bit on the, it's just talking again about, about understanding the different regions and how can we classify just from the data, whether this is an, a residential area or a commercial area or beyond. And we can capture so much on, uh, from the data and classify it as well ba based on points of interest. So we can figure out based on those points of interest, what are we expecting? Uh, we can use a lot of that information. This is back to the CAX campus, uh, and, uh, the, uh, and, and we, we can now figure if we were to introduce new modes of energy. So if we were to introduce PVs and storage, what could be the right modes for it, and where would they be distributed, and how do they connect to the rest of the grid? Uh, this is stuff. But, uh, mobility, we heard a few minutes ago on mobility. We were uh, also very fortunate to, to work with the ADA on this. They came to us asking on what was a question of what's called OD matrices, or origin destination matrices, and, and the question of how can we start seeing where people are coming and going. And so we could classify uh, to every region within Riyadh uh, for every five minutes what are the trips that are being generated and, and beyond. And, and those who are familiar with Riyadh, um, we can see that King Fahad Road is, is picking up as, as the day progresses and we can start seeing those trips uh, emerge. Uh, this is fa fairly old now, but just gives you a flavor of, of what we see. The arcs represent these origin destinations within the city and as they pick up and as the day progresses, we start seeing a lot of those activities moving within Riyadh and so we can capture and, and figure out exactly where people are going within, within the city. Um, we can move from there to identify traffic congestion and, and we, I tend to receive the same question always, so what's the difference between this and Google? And, and there's a significant uh, differentiation so we can compare ourselves to Google, but more importantly we can identify points that generate that congestion, which is critical, which of course Google can do, but they wouldn't provide you. In our case, we are able to pull down all the way to identify what are the areas that are causing that congestion specifically. Uh, and so we can bring in, of course, also the public transit, and now we can start testing scenarios and testing significantly what could happen. So we now can start if-then scenarios of what could happen. So in this case, we're looking at an if-then scenario of um, if there are no, if there is no traffic, uh, if there is no traffic, nothing can compete with the car. It's as simple as that. Now, as soon as you start introducing traffic, then the whole thing changes dramatically. And now we can start seeing that there are different areas that that start to benefit heavily from the metro, and we can change and test a lot when it comes down to that. I'll skip a great deal. We can even look at who are our expected uh, early adopters. Um, uh, we're looking at, in this case, this is a scenario where we're looking at female or unemployed or female unemployed combined and seeing where would they be and uh, as such. Uh, we went on even developing a simple uh, tool, an app here, where from any, even before the metro is, is running, from any location in, in Riyadh, um, at a certain moment in time, of course, this is on the data that is historical. Uh, what is expected? Would it be faster for me to go and use the car or the metro? And we can pinpoint as such what would be, depending, of course, on uh, the, the data of, of traffic that we've had. Um, we also work here with, with uh, the traffic police and to identify accidents within Riyadh. Uh, just, just to clarify, accidents here are the ones in blue. 
And, and so uh, the ones in red are fatalities, sadly. Uh, so, so it just gives you more of the, so you literally can, uh, I cannot remember. This is, this is over a year, I think, uh, in one year, full year. Uh, but, but it shows you um, th that you literally can redraw the whole map by just identifying where, where the accidents are. And we can learn a great deal of that. So we can classify what's happening within the city. We can classify what areas are getting more accidents, what times are being generated and the accidents and, and what have you. But even further, even the black spots, both and the differentiation between them in weekends versus weekdays and, and beyond. And so we learn a great deal of all of, all of this. Urbanism, questions of urbanism are fairly critical to us, so we want to understand, does Riyadh have, for example, one center or multiple centers? And we can analyze this through a tool that we've developed, which is called uh, urban attractors. And so we can classify what are the major attractors in a city at any, uh, uh, again, at any moment in time. We classify them into what we call global attractors, local attractors, and targeted attractors. Uh, global attractors are those that are pulling people from the city, regardless of, okay, uh, from, regardless of from where they are, and, and hence, um, with, uh, so an example there would be the airport, um, and then others which are local attractors, these are your, uh, if you may, local hospitals and, and what have you, which are pulling from a larger uh, uh, radius, but, but not similar to a global attractor. And finally, targeted attractors are much smaller in your own neighborhood type of attractors. And we can classify the city based on all of the above and figure out which ones are what uh, within. Uh, we can even build what we call an urban network. This is pulling data from uh, Foursquare and, and Twitter as well. And, and we can classify if you are to go to a specific location, what are other locations that you are most likely going to as well. And so we can pull a full network of Riyadh's networks as well and where we expect people to go. But more importantly here, we can identify urban anchors, which is very interesting. So in this case, for example, down there at the bottom, which is Zoom, that's IKEA. And we can start seeing that all stores around IKEA are only benefiting from one thing and one thing alone, IKEA. The fact that they're close to IKEA. People do not go to them directly. They're going to IKEA and then when they're done, they can go and visit these stores. And so we can capture a great deal of that. And we develop our own tools. Now, uh, Domino's are talking to us about this, which is smart placement, where, how do, where would you put your best location and where should it be? Uh, we can cl classify this with, with a lot of tools as well, uh, even how we differentiate it between genders and which would be a different area. I have to skip. Um, not many know, but we were the ones, uh, not to be blamed, but for idle lands, we developed uh, the mechanism that is currently being used by the Ministry of Housing to classify costs of land. Uh, I, I won't go through it just because of time, but we classify these tools that we can, uh, for the three regions, and now we're doing Mecca and Medina for the ministry, uh, just to showcase what is the accurate and fair price of a land. And, and this, uh, this just requires significantly a lot of ma mathematical acrobatics just to figure it out. Um, we do a lot of urban modeling as well. Uh, this was, this is taking what we call LIDAR data. LIDAR is a, is a um, for those who are not, is a radar data uh, that, of, of a plane that goes over the city, captures a point cloud, and we can translate that point cloud into 3D models. We went on the, uh, doing fairly aggressive acrobatics here of trying to transform that cloud into actual 3D models to develop the first 3D model for Riyadh City. This is just showing the CACS campus using such uh, the pipeline we had developed and, and currently patenting as well. Uh, social cultural, I'll end with this, that time does not permit, just because I think it just gives a flavor of, of what we, we tend to do. Uh, this is taking cell phone uh, uh, information, and this is with STC. These are the cell phone towers within, within the city of Riyadh. And we start looking and understanding a great deal of even what are the activities that are happening throughout the day, just purely from cell phone information. Um, so we can, this is 24 hours, you can start seeing that uh, it starts at midnight, lowest activity happening at around 4 a.m., and then it starts to pick up all the way through, and, uh, and we know where are the activities happening as well within the city, on, on spatially in the top. But then we noticed a fairly interesting activity, which was these drops that were happening across the day. And we can look at those and hone in, and we see that as we moved it even to other cities in, in the kingdom, we still see these activities happening again and again. And interestingly, those were all due to prayer times. So you start seeing that culture has a significant effect of even our own activities. People tend to not do phone calls 
at prayer times. And the question is then how? Now, uh, we did take this a few steps further and developed a religious index. So we can tell you if Al-Ghat is as religious as they claim or not. And, <laughs> and, uh, and not that we would ever share it with anyone, but, but just gives you the flavor of, of how we can use such data. We can also capture what's called uh, um, uh, population dynamics. We know not static uh, population, which is what region has what, but we can tell you at what moment in time is this area within the city of Riyadh, what population does it have at that moment in time. And so we can do that. We do a lot on what we call city vibes here, where we're using Twitter data just to capture vibes on, on this. And I, I, don't, I think I did hide a few slides. It was driven by uh, competition in, in, the, in the students on who has more uh, uh, well, followers as such. This was Hilal or Nasr. So it's not as, 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 as uh, uh, oh, they have it here on Al Khairu. So this is not what they were trying to show. This is, this is they're claiming something that is not necessarily, it was really driven by does Al-Hilal have more followers or Nasr as such? For those who are not familiar, those are uh, clubs, with, uh, football clubs within, within um, Saudi Arabia. Now more interestingly for our female uh, participants here, we were trying to understand a great deal of what's happening when it comes down to females versus males. And, and so we understand a great deal of those activities. And the driver here was, do females do more phone calls versus males? And can we classify them to start with and, and as such? And um, uh, so on the activity on the left, and I do apologize from the feminists in the room, it wasn't my choice on pink, but just to be on the safe side. And, and, and the, the idea here, you can start seeing the, the activities picking up. I don't think this, this works. Yeah, it doesn't. But, but the activities picking up at around in the morning, and there this uh, um, uh, a significant peak that's happening at 2 p.m. And those all all driven by them calling their drivers to pick them up or, or, or drop them. But the, the analysis we went on, which is not actually included here, so back to that question, does, do females talk more or, or males? In fact, in Riyadh, uh, males actually did talk more. Uh, so, we're, we're the, no, but just to clarify, females talked longer. Uh, <laughs> and just, just to, so it's less phone calls, longer. Uh, phone calls and just to, to clarify the differentiation between both we can classify even what we call gendered spaces we know which in which space are what's happening there we pull here data from Twitter uh, Foursquare and even taxis uh, and so we can classify a region is it more uh, female oriented or not uh, within the city as, as time progresses I'll, I'll skip labor uh, for the sake of time but we can also know a great deal of, of what you are just for I'll skip a lot of this on labor just because of time. I'll end with decision support systems that we tend to develop. We tend to develop a lot of our own tools. Uh, sadly, we have way more uh, advanced tools, but I, I, don't, I didn't have time to show more a lot of this, but shows you on, on 2D and 3D what we can do. This is very, very old, so I do apologize, but just gives you a flavor of, of, of what we tend to do. So we can, we can these are um, um, GIS types of, of tools, but on, on steroids, where we can ask Endless times of questions, where are the males, females, what, what's happening, uh, where are the employed, unemployed. And a lot of this is not just using data that currently exists, but building on a lot of the analytics that we are uh, using and deploying on, on, uh, on, on, on the city. Uh, we're expecting even further now, we're also developing for uh, the General Authority of Statistics currently their data platform. So we're, we're going with that, we expect a great deal of enhancement of, of some of the comparisons for their data as well as ours uh, in that regard. Uh, I'll skip, this is for Wazarat al Iskan. this is a tool that we had developed for them just to understand what's happening within the different uh, regions. Uh, apologies for those who don't talk, uh, speak Arabic. Sorry, or in this case, read Arabic. But just showcases a great deal of the ability to, to navigate a lot of the data sets that we currently have on all of those regions. <coughs> I'll end with, again, this is the tool that uh, we had developed for them to capture. Um, They've enhanced it on their own in a, in a different manner as well. They added a few additional layers uh, as well at this stage. But it can show which, which regions and how do you calculate the cost of, of each. Uh, finally, I think, oops, there's a movie. Can you try to run it? 
Yeah, can, do you mind clicking on the move? <laughs> yes, just on the move, yes. Oh, yeah, exactly, thank you. Oops, no. Again, thank you. So this was a movie, we, well, this is a tool we had developed. We to, in addition to our um, uh, web applications, we developed what we call tangible interfaces. And this is for a uh, project that the ADA initially had, I know now PIF is, is looking at, which is called um, uh, the Central Riyadh Project. And so we were developing this tool uh, for them at the time to show as they change what is the usability within that region, there is a simulation engine that's connected to it that shows changes in traffic, changes in energy, and, and beyond. And uh, that's the, the tool we take around to showcase. We have a more aggressive uh, tool uh, at, at, at the center, which, is, uh, which we call the Koti I system, uh, just, just showcasing a great deal of what's happening there. And so this is just for any region we can start changing, uh, and depending on the parameters that uh, are of interest for the decision itself, we can change a great deal of those parameters and see what's happening uh, almost in real time of the effect of a decision. So it is not, decisions are not happening later, but really at a fairly early stage. With that said, thank you so much. I do apologize significantly for taking way longer than I deserve. Thank you. Um, we usually cut our speakers much quicker, but when there are cool maps, I, I can't resist, so I keep them going. Um, so this is, this is an excellent combination of, uh, uh, of perspectives. I mean, we highlighted population growth and density. Uh, we highlighted t uh, uh, big data and access to data, which is um, uh, really transforming the way we understand our cities. And now the big intervention of in infrastructure development and um, planning of the Riyadh Metro. So if I could ask each of you to summarize what has been the, the kind of legacy of our cities until today, and now with these changes happening, what would be the priority for us going forward? Um, so I'll share, ask you to summarize this before I open it up for discussion. Uh, well, I think uh, the legacy of Saudi cities actually is, is, is uh, that uh, there wasn't any uh, planning or architecture in the past. And now we are looking for a, tran a transformation, actually, and we're looking for more sustainable uh, cities, uh, actually, to uh, uh, have good walkability and good well-being for the people, actually. And, and, and the transformation and the Vision 2030, actually, is looking for these sustainable cities. So uh, I think the way to go forward, actually, is... is, is uh, uh, for me, as, uh, tra as the transit and the public transport project is, is TODs in the beginning, actually, to transform these cities and to uh, be one of the leading cities in the world. Uh, actually, uh, architecture is a, is a very important aspect in transit-oriented development that we want to see, and we want the transformation of planning, architecture, and all the area to be... Uh, attractive and, and to show the city uh, in a way to be the one of the 100, uh, one of the top 100 cities in the world. So. Uh, well, in my view, I mean, I may have expressed a bit about some of the challenges, but also I, I want to go back and re-emphasize that. Uh, I mean, uh, cities today, I mean, one of the challenges we, we or one of the, ex uh, uh, 2030 ambitions is to have three cities of the kingdom in the top 100 list. So what top 100 list of, of, of quality of city, quality of life, and all those, those are one of the ambitions of 2030. So if we look into that, uh, we really need to think about, uh, uh, I mean, the future in terms of physical development and organization and our response to economic challenges in cities. Uh, also communities uh, need to, we need to create more productive environments for them. So creating space, architectures, not just in the form of beautification of buildings, but also functionality and connectivity, I think is very important. Another area is about maybe, uh, His Royal Highness uh, maybe alluded to, 
is that cities need to have very clear strategies. And it's not just about city plans in its physical form. But when we look at cities, and I call them the big boys, who are now, I mean, already have passed two to three million in population, are still hi highly dependent on decisions being made at the national level. I think cities start, city leaders and city managers should start to think about their cities as units of, of economic development and communities and see what is the future of their city? What, what is the role in the whole uh, national uh, development of the kingdom? And I think that is, a, uh, the national government has lots of other issues that has to deal with and I think cities are, have become uh, very dependent on, on that. Uh, maybe lastly is about, I mean, I don't want to be the negative part of the, of, the, of the panel, but I'm just saying is that these are challenges with all the big data and information. We always complain that we don't have data, we don't have information. I think uh, Dr. Anas has proved that there is lots of data, and there's many ways to interpret it and to, to analyze it. And to, the question is, what do we have, do, what solutions do we have? In, in creating those the creativity, I think. And I think yesterday there was a discussion about, uh, from uh, the dean of, uh, I think, uh, uh, Effet uh, Sleiman. She was talking about, with all the technology we have, it's all, it goes boils down to us as creative people and understanding how, in terms of design, in terms of understanding how our culture could be translated into the future. So. I think uh, with all the technologies we have, it goes, boils down to us as practitioners in interpreting that and bringing it, for, uh, taking it forward. So uh, it's a human challenge and it's a global discussion. And being an active community, we need to be active locally and also be active globally. And I, I encourage people to, to be part of that kind of discussion at all levels. And I think this is a very good uh, start of those kind of open discussions about. Thanks, uh, well, I, I won't take more than, than, I, than I already had taken, so I'll, I'll keep it very brief, and, and I think uh, both my colleagues here have, have covered way more uh, than, than uh, I'll, I'll be able to cover, and they've been, they've been very eloquent in stating it. Um, I'll, I'll just comment to the students, at least. I'm, 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 an, uh, I'm a, uh, a mentor, and, and, and that's part of what I tend to do. It's, it's interesting to see the evolution of disciplines and, and how they change over time. Um, at a time where, um, um, at my time, and I'm, I'm hopeful I'm not that old, but, but, but when I started looking at, at, at the fields of interest, um, our fields of, of civil engineering, transportation, architecture, weren't as cool as, as you may think they were. And, and they were really not seen necessarily as the coolest fields. And I can start seeing this fascinating evolution now, where now topics of mobility, yeah, we've transformed the word from transportation to mobility, but it's still the same topic. And now it's one of those cool topics. Now Google wants to get um, involved, and Apple wants to be there, and, and so on and so forth. Smart cities now, same thing. And we can start seeing this evolution of what these topics are. Uh, and we see a lot, even all the way down to smart homes and architecture and, and beyond. So it's, it's just literally a fascinating time, as I see it, just from that educational perspective, that is, there is sig this significant comeback for these disciplines. And, and there's a lot to be done. Uh, not necessarily in the same traditional approach to these disciplines, but there is definitely way more to be done in, in these fields. And, and this is just food for thought for those who are interested in, in evolving themselves even further. Um, I'll open it up for discussion. If I, we already have a question. Uh, microphones. Ziad Abam, I'd like to ask a question on a little bit higher level in a holistic way. Uh, and and um, uh, I'd like to see if Dr. Anas or anyone uh, like to answer it. Um, if we are aiming for the vision 2030 and uh, what we are doing basically in uh, um, 
the empowerment of the digital uh, possibilities that Dr. Anas sh just showed us. I believe that um, what you have presented is more of um, an, an, analysis, an analysis of the data, big data. And of course, the analysis is one part of the entire holistic approach to development. And our vision leads us to reach a development, holistic development, socioeconomic and physical and so on. How are you integrating uh, the analysis with the synthesis, uh, with all various uh, entities, and uh, you just mentioned right now uh, the students as well, education. And then how we take the uh, analysis and the synthesis to the synthesis, uh, which we, I called yesterday the growing together. Because at the end, um, we cannot have, and, and what you have showed us is extremely impressive, um, we cannot have uh, one brain uh, with artificial intelligence in the kingdom uh, leading all this and connecting to all the power in the world in terms of digital possibilities and, and not disseminate that and, and grow together. So my question to you at this point is um, what's the vision for 2030 and what's your local vision for taking analysis to synthesis design and all that, and then take it further to synthesis so that we all can grow together, empowered not just as artificial intelligence, but human intelligence. And I'd like to uh, just cite one example of cloud computing by Amazon that they have, uh, they're going to empower small and medium businesses in the world, not just big companies, to use their cloud computing power. So they're not just looking at big gains, commercial big gains, but also to really empower humanities in general. So do we have such models there? And what's your plan uh, for the future, for the synthesis, the integration, and growing together? Dr. Anas? That's a fairly well, well multifaceted question. So, so let, let, me, let me just start, I think, where, from the beginning, and, and at least we'll, with the analysis versus. So for those who are familiar with, with design science, uh, there is something called the generate and test loop. Uh, as well, which is you would generate a solution, you would then eventually test it. And, and this test is this analysis of such. Um, so analysis is a precursor to, to the concept of synthesis. Whatever we want to do, you have to start by understanding and then eventually coming up with a solution and back and forth. And, and hence, a lot of what we were doing as, as such and as I presented was on the analytics, so on the analysis. That doesn't mean that we didn't venture through uh, the um, uh, synthesis, that's where we started developing our decision support systems. Uh, as you do such, this is what could happen. Uh, and so we were showcasing at the end where I showcased the, the um, uh, CoTI platform uh, the, as a platform where you could interact with, see act, uh, the, the effects of certain decisions. And I showed a little bit of a brief as well on the, on the energy uh, side where certain decisions on, on, uh, on even how do you infuse and change the energy mix in certain areas. We do a great deal of the synthesis, mostly currently on the national scale, uh, more than, 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 the, than the city scale, just because of a planning perspective. What would be the right uh, approach to, to many of these things? But, but we do capture it, and to some degree in, in multiple domains in different manner, uh, in a different manner. Um, the question of um, uh, 
the second part of your question, I think you had two questions. One on, on us was how does synthesis get inf infused, and then this other question of how can we grow together. Um, we have been collaborating with many, many entities, and, and hence uh, the focus our focus has been to empower these entities, and, and we work with many. So currently on our roster, we have the Ministry of Health, where we're helping them. We're working with the Ministry of uh, Housing. We're working with SEC. We're, we're, we're working with a, a large set of different players uh, who are both interested in and are willing to collaborate and work on these, these problems. And, and we would like to, to any entity or agency that is, is uh, interested, uh, we're always open uh, to, to participate and, and help um, and empower them as much as we can. Uh, we're also very keen on developing, as I said earlier, that next generation of leaders. And so many of those will be uh, hopefully disseminating in the, in the community and uh, in bringing change on their own. We currently have, um, when it comes down to, for example, in the case of MIT, the largest number of MIT uh, graduate students uh, by far compared to any institution in the kingdom. And uh, it's not only in MIT. We have them in Stanford, in Berkeley, in Harvard, in uh, Cambridge, in Oxford, just to name a few. Uh, and, and hence, the model has been empowerment. Uh, going to your comment on Amazon, just, just to, to, to end it with that, uh, I seriously doubt the Amazon's argument there is purely to empower the, the globe. I think there is definitely a commercial twist there. Uh, we work with Amazon heavily. Uh, we work with them in Badr. They did provide heavily a lot of those licenses. Uh, and it is uh, more or less to get you used to the tools and their platform so you can eventually start using it more and more and eventually subscribing to even higher features for it. So I, I would seriously doubt it is completely as, as uh, uh, non-commercial as it, as it sounds. I, I think there is a very strong commercial inclination there. Um, and, and I applaud them for their, their uh, activities, don't get me wrong, but I, I wouldn't want to say it's done purely to save the planet. That, that's, that's not, I think, how they, they function. Great. We have another question. Well, and, and uh, now, let's uh, let's yeah. give other other people a chance to, to ask. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, uh, I appreciate you know the, um, uh, the the great work you are doing on like collecting big data and uh, uh, but my in reference to Riyadh especially as an example, uh, I'm very happy to see public transportation scheme like the metro for instance. Uh, and I'm not singling it out, but when I saw the video, uh, um, the image I got in my head is like Moscow or Los Angeles, like, m you know, hundreds of thousands of more cars than what we already have, um, mecha mechanical systems, you know, like the metro, uh, expansion in every direction. Uh, the city of Riyadh is, uh, is like expanding infinitely in all directions. There is no limit uh, to, to, to the city. It stretched uh, the fabrics of the city, you know, so thin that now Riyadh is a city without a heart, physically and subjectively as well. Uh, I was hoping for a, a city for the future, Riyadh, to see greener spaces, more compact developments, pockets of you know, parks, small and big, uh, more walkability, more chances to walk. Uh, I didn't sense any of that, you know, and if this is the future, and I'm speaking here as a concerned citizen, not, not a professional, um, if this is the future 2030 or even 2060, uh, I don't want to stay in Riyadh. Uh, we already had this for the past 30 years. No, we want you to stay, actually. We I want would you want, to stay and uh, well, use the system. Uh, yes, I would want to stay, but um, uh, more asphalt and more, you know, ring roads. Uh, now Riyadh Airport, 30 years ago, was way outside the city. Now the city is actually on, on the fence of, of, of the airport. Uh, so, uh, I mean, Abdelilah al-Sheikh mentioned that, you know, a city has to have a strategy. Uh, is there a strategy? I understand that you have, and I appreciate that uh, Anas al Faris mentioned that they have to consult with a lot of entities. Uh, but w when you say entities or committees, I'm, I really raise the red flag because uh, 
entities are always proxies of what people want. I mean, are there even public consultations in Riyadh uh, to take these decisions? You know, consultations with yeah. citizens. Uh, so. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll start, Saud, if you'd like to answer. Uh, thank you so much for your question, uh, and we really appreciate it, and we appreciate all uh, questions and, and uh, about the metro system and how it will be and the strategy. Actually, the video you saw is, is the metro video. There is a lot of things happening in parallel with the metro project. One of the main things, what we talked about, is transit-oriented development. Uh, Transit-oriented development concentrates on, on the areas around stations and what will happen in these areas to make it attractive to people, actually. And what you mentioned from walkability, sustainability, all, all the aspects you, and elements you mentioned, we consider in, around these areas. We have a, per, a perimeter of 800 meters that will be fully transformed, transformed sorry, uh, planning-wise, architecture-wise, and also uh, socially. So we are looking actually in these aspects and we are uh, very concerned uh, about people and the way uh, they will uh, react to this project. Uh, we are against cars, all the metro, all the engineers and, and people working in the metro, we want to reduce the use of cars because the, w from our studies actually, uh, in the year 2030, uh, the average speed will get to 18 kilometers without uh, an hour without the metro system. So we are against that pollution, all the aspects that, that uh, uh, comes from uh, the cars and, and transportation, uh, we, we are against. So we are looking to have a sustainable system and a new m form of mobility for the city. So, so all these aspects are looking, looking at, and we are looking at it very carefully, actually. Great. So, um, Abdelhaf, you'd like to contribute to this discussion? Yes. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I think uh, I tried to, uh, I mean, in a very general form, talk about the challenge of cities in, in the kingdom. So uh, this challenge of, of low-density, car-based uh, design is not something new. I mean, this is a model we adopted since the 1950s, 1960s, and we built on it. And um, very uh, smart uh, land traders also benefited a lot from it. So land speculation actually feeded into this whole land, this urban sprawl and this endless subdivision of land without clear understanding of what we're going to build on it. Now, the, the whole transportation uh, mode is, is not just in Riyadh, it's coming into four or five cities in the kingdom at once. And this is like a, a backlog of, of development we should have started since the 70s. Uh, having said that, the challenge is not about installing the, that major infrastructure component. It's really, uh, is as you rightly said, the challenge is creating the right spaces, the, the ability to reach these stations, this ability to, to create this human scale environment for people to, 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 to appreciate and to live and to work. Uh, and the second thing, I think, is the challenge is density. The, the whole, um, I mean, economics of public transport is dependent on ridership. And as I said, uh, I quoted an expert who's a leading figure globally, came to the kingdom several times, was talking about, I mean, I put it in a joke about doubling density, which is really quadruple density. So I think that is, the de that is the challenge, not just for Riyadh, I think for most of our cities in the next 20, 30 years. And this is where it also comes to us as practitioners in really understanding the challenge and working with uh, leadership in trying to provide solutions and transformation. Because it's not an easy cha challenge to work on existing environments, existing cities. But we might have an, a, an, a, a, an opportunity in working with uh, inner city and also creating more density in, the, in areas around the transport systems to, 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 to overcome that. So it's just a challenge we need to discuss and work. I think that the, the relationship between the metro and density is that the metro hopefully will create more density. However, you also need 
the density to make, to make the metro successful. So what comes first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> I mean, we've chosen to now start with, with the public transport. So we're doing that uh, as central government mm -hmm. is funding it. Uh, we, the question is how do we really uh, encourage investment around the stations? The second thing I think is that once those uh, uh, areas around the stations and those corridors become more attractive, we come at the issue of equity. Who needs the public transport more? And will they be priced out of that uh, accessibility? So we might end up with a model where the most capable financially living on those corridors and the much less capable to, 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 to get a car or to, are living on the periphery. And that's another dilemma we can, we can fall into. So uh, I think we need to learn from experiences from other cities around the world and understand the economics of it uh, and try to find policies. And that's why I said cities have to have very clear, deliberate strategies and decisions on how those complex systems uh, integrate together and how that impact, I mean, people's lives and, 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 uh, and uh, capacity to, 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 uh, to uh, access those. Uh, those. Uh, and also for the strategy of Riyadh, we have uh, MedStar actually. It's uh, the, the full strategy for Riyadh and give, it looks at, looks, looks at all aspects of the city, transportation, economics, uh, uh, public services, oh, covers everything. We are working and, and we have a lot of, of more than 100 strategies for the, for the city uh, to look at, at all aspects and we are updating it now and we're working on MedStar too. So this will be the strategy, the full strategy for the city in all aspects. Um, I'm going to take the last questions because definitely ran way out of time. So let's take, let's start. Um, we have two here from the front row. Go ahead. Hello, are you? Ala Tarabzuni. I want to thank uh, Jawahar and all the panelists. Um, my question is regarding Dr. Anas' presentation. Um, the, you know, what I'm sure is an immense effort in uh, collecting the work and translating the data. Um, I think the strength of this, uh, this work is in its accessibility. So my question is, is it accessibility through an entity such as CAXT or the ADA, or is this data uh, a private? Dr. Uh, do you have a... Yeah. Uh, my question is to Dr. Anas, you know, uh, I just wanted to know if you assisted uh, at the level of happiness of the people of the cities, you know. Are they happy with the built environment outside their houses? Do they enjoy going outside? How, how long they stay there or they keep themselves or trap themselves inside the houses and how long they stay outside? So all of this, you know, tells us how successful the city is. Thank you. Dr. Sami. Thank you very much. It seems I missed a very important uh, session, but uh, shall I'll catch up. Uh, two days ago, I was with uh, a very important uh, part of that uh, division of 30, which is uh, to do with the quality of life and so on. And again, I'm noticing so, I mean, something that we talk mostly about city, 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 city. Saudi Arabia is maybe has two, three, four, five city, and I hope not to think too much of cities. We have towns. City is a very strange being that even has no meaning in Arabic. Town is Al Medina. But anyway, having said that, there is villages, there is neighborhood, there is uh, uh, Hajar, there is uh, mountains, there is desert. Uh, so I, I really. The cities maybe need to be rehumanized, rehabilitated in a different way than the concept of uh, New York or other cities. There is sometimes very nice uh, what's so called city, like I don't know where, Boston, for example, where I lived, uh, uh, and Austin and so on. But really, we have to think around and see what about the rest of the Saudi Arabia? 
and we do want to have Saudi Arabia to become cities. Uh, so uh, I, I think there's some, I'm sure maybe there's a lot of work that I don't know about, but I just want to call the attention that how to reorient ourselves in, in the right uh, direction that 2030 is looking at as a vision. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so maybe we'll start with a question on data access. Okay, so I, I think this is a question which also is, is fairly confused sometimes. The data that we get access to, a lot of it is, is public, so it's not, not necessarily not public. It's the, the, the math that comes to it and, and is layered on top of it. So the data itself, um, if you were to look at it, it would be meaningless. And, and hence, uh, really you have to understand how much you, you need to process a great deal of that data to understand what you're getting out of it. So in, in, in essence, uh, I, I didn't see where the, the, the question was, so I can't direct, oh, you were here. I was looking for you. So, uh, I was looking who was the one, the one asking the question. But, um, uh, but back again to your, uh, to your question, it's a lot of that processing that happens to it. And uh, which requires, again, as I said earlier, um, a lot of that, that real heavy math lifting that comes with it. Uh, for example, when I mentioned the, uh, the um, data on housing, uh, the land valuation. Land valuation is it's, it's data that's public. You have it at, at the Ministry of Justice, and you can go ahead and use it. The problem is that the data there was highly problematic. There were, uh, hopefully no one from the Ministry of Justice here. Uh, uh, I meant it in, in the best possible way I could. <laughs> but but the, the data, so there were many uh, data points there that were classified as villas versus uh, actual lands and interchangeably. So we would, we would revisit, re revisit a data point and it would be a villa, but it was classified as a land and, and vice versa. Um, so can, I, can I just add, so, so the, while this data, I mean, the ability for CACs to acquire this data and, and make it available for research, is it, is it something that can be shared with other universities? So, so I'll, 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 I'll get back to that specifically, but I just wanted to clarify that element as well. So in other words, there was that process that required that heavy lifting, and we had to do a lot of machine learning just to classify, a cl cleansing the data, differentiating what is a villa versus what's not, understanding how do we go through that process, and then coming back with a set, a data set that's now actually clean that we can trust and that we can use uh, uh, to actually calculate the real prices of, of data. Uh, there are data sets, as I said, the one public data sets, we, which we use heavily, they're public anywhere. The ones that we process, well, that's a different story uh, because there has been a lot of work on what, and, and that required a lot of man hours really to process, uh, and hence we need to utilize. Uh, there are data sets that we had to sign uh, literally using our blood, literally. Uh, I mean, that's how far it, it required. Uh, for example, STC. Uh, STC were very adamant that we don't show anything on their data sets uh, that, that mobile could use. So we would showcase everything down to the nitty gritty details of how much are we processing it. And, and now we, we're expecting even further collaborations with STC that they're requiring on, on, on again, big data analytics as well. But, but I'm, I'm just trying to assess that the idea or the assumption that it is just purely access to data, there is a lot of public data out there. It's not that, uh, that it's hidden. It's what you do with that data that really matters. Um, happiness. Uh, interestingly, one of my students is doing now their master's thesis on a happiness um, metric. Uh, they're using it, again, for Switzerland, which is not really qualifies for, for, for the assessment, but we're trying to, to use that same process because it was his thesis and he's now doing part of it in Carnegie Mellon, but, but we're hoping to use and, and evolve that metric down to Riyadh. Uh, I heard a few minutes ago on, on walkability, for example. You said walkability, and I heard a lot. And, and so we did a lot of analysis on walkability in Saudi Arabia. And we did a survey, an extensive survey, trying to, to, to uh, capture what would be the best walkability. And it differentiated dramatically between ma male versus female, uh, age group, and what have you. Uh, but I'll just give you a number, and it's not a magical number. It was 150 meters, which is allowed for, for, uh, for walkability. At least that was the average we computed at the end of the day to achieve moving to uh, the metro or, or beyond. Um, and then again, that's, that's a heuristic, so I, I would take that with a grain of salt, but, but, uh, but to address your, your, your question there. Uh, with the rest, I think there was a question that was directed more 
Yeah, I think with, uh, if we can address the question of uh, the city versus rural oh, okay. um, um, uh, town. Maybe, I, I mean, um, I touched upon that in the, in the start of, of my talk, and you might have missed that. I was talking about that, I mean, already the kingdom, 80% of its population live in cities and urban settlements. So we're talking about the general of 32 million already are residing with those. Uh, the rest are within uh, rural areas and, and Hejar, and as we say. 70% uh, of them live in 16 cities for today. So that is a fact of today, and it's a fact of our development and our modality. Well, I mean, the, ver the reverse is a challenge. I mean, whether the reverse is, is something we want. Now, having said that, there, I've been part of a work that is for the past three years with MOMRA uh, in my capacity as an advisor on the National Spatial Strategy. So the National Spatial Strategy, uh, even Dr. Ziad Adam participated with us in that. And it's a collaboration between MOMRA, Minister of Planning, uh, in terms of setting out the future agenda of uh, urban development, rural development, and, and creating the balance. The, the new urban agenda today that has been adopted in 2016, today there's the World Urban Forum in Kuala Lumpur, and even the address of, of, of uh, Prince Charles, uh, I mean, two days ago to, to the forum, was about creating this balance between rural and urban, uh, urban settlements. So uh, I, I totally agree that the, the challenge of addressing that, even how we deal with, with, with the infringement of urban on rural and also uh, the environment. So uh, I agree with that and, and we, we, we are now, I mean, as a kingdom, looking into those kind of strategies. And I will make you aware that within the next month or half, there is a, a green paper on the National Spatial Strategy that will be published and exposed for public discussion and will be put on a website or something. And I really encourage everyone to participate in that discussion. There's another green paper on our new planning act. And it talks about what models of uh, how planning should be performed, who has uh, responsibilities, and all of that is coming in the pipeline. So I encourage all of us as practitioners and citizens to be part of that dialogue and discussion, providing feedback to government on, on really what is our aspirations towards the future of the kingdom. Uh, having said that, we, we should also not neglect the responsibility of our uh, government leaders and, 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 and city managers towards addressing the challenges, uh, encouraging young people, practitioners to participate and not look at it in just a bureaucratic uh, procedure and process. Uh, there's lots of crea creativity that could be brought into the process and, and, and linking the past to, to the future. So I totally agree, I mean, with that, with that issue, but I think I emphasized more on cities because of the subject of the panel, so that was. So, would you like to respond to the city versus? I think covered this very well. Okay, great. Thank you so much for this uh, discussion. I would keep you all day, really, uh, but uh, we have to move on to the next session. Thank you all. Um, so our next panel is going to be on mapping and documentation. Um, we'll leave it to them.